accentuated the isolation of the area. On the last Monday before Christmas in 1996, Sophie's body was found by the gate leading to her house. Inside, nothing appeared amiss, no signs of an intrusion. The bed had been slept in. A wallet full of cash beside it was undisturbed. Close to midnight, she had her last conversation with her husband, Daniel, on the phone from France nothing untoward yet there was also blood on the back door and blood particles on the gate a concrete block lay beside her body the state pathologist decided it had been used to inflict her head injuries local people in Skull are shocked by the incident they say there's been no indication of any crime in the tour more area before not even break-ins Guardian Skull are tonight preparing for a full-scale murder hunt over the Christmas period. Gordy and County Cork are treating as suspicious the death of a woman whose partly clothed body was found this morning. is understood to have been French and to have owned a holiday home in... Gardy would later identify the body as Sophie Toscan de Plantier, a 39-year-old film producer from France. The state pathologist was called but didn't get there till the following day. This morning, the body was removed from the scene, followed in a car by state pathologist Dr. John Harbison. Who had His verdict, Sophie was killed by multiple blows to the head with a blunt object. The lesions on her hands suggested self-defense. Some of the numerous scratches could have been caused by brambles. No exact time of death could be established. In case the murderer may be being shielded in the area, Gardy said they want to hear from anyone who may have noticed a person with suspicious wounds or cuts or with stained or marked clothing. The killing has shocked the village of Skull in West Cork, about 65 miles from Cork City. Launching a door-to-door -door inquiry, Gardy gave the people of Skull a questionnaire to fill out. They took fingerprint and hair samples from some locals. Last known pictures of Sophie Tuscan de Plantier as she arrived in Cork Airport on December 20th last. Airline passenger lists have been checked and the French police are closely cooperating, but it's not yet clear whether the killer was foreign or local or was known to the dead woman. Over 50 suspects were quickly eliminated from inquiries. Her husband, a former lover, and some neighbours were ruled out early on. It was believed the murderer's clothes would have been spattered with blood and that because of the struggle the dead woman put up before dying, the killer would also have been cut and bruised. Just before 11 o'clock this morning, a team of Gardaí investigating the murder visited a house near Skull in West Cork and arrested one man. This afternoon, a woman was also detained and brought to Bandon Garda Station. Almost a decade has passed since Sophie Toscan du Plantier's murder and today her parents, Georges and Marguerite Bouniol, marked the anniversary by placing flowers at the spot. Seeking new ways to reinvigorate the murder investigation, family and friends established Asoff, the Association for the Truth about Sophie Toscan de Plantier. De la coopération judiciaire. Also, what is the concern is the absence of cooperation between the two states, France and Ireland, who have not worked together for the past 10 years 
and who haven't made one iota of progress in the area of legal cooperation. French detectives and forensic scientists arriving at Cork Airport this evening to take statements and examine exhibits gathered during the Garda investigation. In 2008, the French investigating magistrate received the entire Garda file. Sophie's body was exhumed for more advanced forensic testing. Witnesses were re-interviewed. My mother, when she was 16, she used to have two summers in Ireland for learning English, and she, she fell in love with the country. She was crazy in love with the people, with the life, and she always wanted to share it with people, and especially with me. Before being Sophie Toscan du Plantier, she was Sophie Bugno, and then my mother. She was everything for me. News of her murder first reached Sophie Toscan de Plantier's family through the French media. First of all, we have heard in the news uh, some, something happened in this area. They have spoken about a French lady, but no confirmation, so you still have hope that it, it, is, uh, it will be different. This very short portion of my life where everything changed, I keep it for, for me. It's too strong, it's too personal to, to share with, to share with people. If I ask you if you remember what happened on September 11, it's exactly the same for us. It's something that is printed in your mind and in your memory. My last day of being a, a child. Madame de Plantier's death sparked off an intensive murder investigation. But with five days to go to her first anniversary, charges have yet to be brought in the case. 
Initially supportive, as the Garda case stalled in 1997 and 98, Sophie's family became quite trenchant in their criticism of the Irish authorities. When we met for the first time the, the Irish police, we have a good exchange with, with them. That's, that's true. At the same time, they didn't succeed. This has angered her family, and in an interview published in the Examiner newspaper today, their lawyer accuses the Department of Justice here of stalling a request for access to the file on the case. To, to, kill, to kill her and to take her life away, so it's not an accident. Non mais qu'est-ce que qu'est-ce que tu qu'est-ce que tu attends de la justice Moi ce que j'attends c'est que c'est que un jour ou l'autre quand même la justice soit faite hein et que les assassins de ma fille soient quand même arrêtés et puis jugés je dis jugés j'ai pas dit condamné mais j'ai dit jugés c'est quoi la différence Ben il y en a peut-être pas <rire> Tu penses qu'on aura justice J'espère en tout cas que vous, vous le verrez. Là, vous la verrez cette justice. Nous, j'en sais rien parce que ça fait 20 ans qu'on attend. Hein. Ça fait 20 ans que c'est arrivé. Alors c'est encore 20 ans, nous c'est sûr qu'on ne sera plus là. Mais pour vous, et pour toi surtout. Moi je pense pour toi et tes enfants et tout le monde, je pense. J'espère qu'un jour. Je pense qu'on l'aura. Je suis même sûr qu'on l'aura à la justice. Moi, c'est ce que je souhaite, mais dans cette minute. Mais tu penses qu'on l'aura Je souhaite que vous l'ayez. 20 years later, the case is still open for my parents who are now tired, uh, who are uh, sick and old. Uh, it's a day to day difficulty for them. They have no answer to their question. I'm angry, I'm very angry against that, but I'm more sorrow because of what my sister lost. It's an obligation for us to give her, to give her memory the truth. of the murder, Ian Bailey and his partner Jules Thomas lived some four miles from the crime scene. A journalist in England, Bailey was working odd jobs when he moved to Ireland and met artist Jules Thomas. Her tenant at first, he later moved into their shared home, the Prairie, just outside Skull. I had a phone call from a journalist uh, at about maybe 22, 2 on the Monday of the 23rd. And he asked me, in effect, to go out on the story ahead of him, and he was going to drive down the N71 from Bandon, and it would meet me later. He gave me basic information about the fact that there'd been a, an unnatural or death, I think, I did, it wasn't referred to as a murder, of a foreign national, female, possibly French. That journalist gave statements and evidence to the effect that he didn't tell you what nationality she was. Well, that he may well have given evidence to that, but it's not the case. We didn't have any name, we didn't, didn't have anything really to go on. So Ian said, let's wait till the, was it two o'clock news, I think. And we heard that it was a French woman on that. Ian, a few years previously, had been working for a guy where he had a French neighbor. So we drove up there. Jules came with me because she's a photographer, and I said, you better come, maybe there'll be a photograph you could take. Did Ian appear to know where he was going as you drove to Sophie Tosca and Plantier's house? His hunch was, and it was only a hunch, was it was the only French person he could think of in the area. On one occasion, while she was in residence in the cottage, I saw a person inside the house at some considerable distance. I wouldn't have been able to recognize them, known who they were. So did you ever meet her? No, I didn't ever meet her. Jules Thomas and Ian Bailey were among the first on the scene. I could see there was activity. And as I walked towards the scene, two officers walked towards me. And I asked, was there any information that they could give me as a journalist there on behalf of the Cork Examiner uh, about what was going on? And the, one of them said to me, 
No, you'll, all information will come from the Garda Press Bureau, and you should ring them. Jules had taken photographs in the meantime. From there, I went, I drove, I carried on driving to the post office. And I remember in the post office, the, the, the postmistress gave me a name, which was Boon Oil. Bailey would report on the murder for two Irish papers, The Star and The Sunday Tribune. Gardy would later claim that Bailey's articles seemed to indicate knowledge of the victim's injuries. There was information coming out. The guards gave certain information. For instance, I was working with a photographer from Bantry, and they came by information that, the, 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 that her hands had been injured. But that was information that came to me via other journalists. And the nature of her head injury, how did you know about I didn't, that? I don't think I did. I think there was a story generally going around and everybody seemed to know, when I say everybody, literally, I mean, people were saying her head, she'd been, uh, a block had been used to, to, to smash her head. I had hair pulled from my, as did my partner, and we gave it. Um, on the basis that in, in Sophie's hand had been found hair. My view was this, you know, take my DNA, test it against the DNA you found, and you will find it isn't mine. Would you be happy to submit your DNA now again in 2017? Uh, I, I, well, at one, I'm, I don't have to. I'm not being asked to, but in principle, I wouldn't have an objection. Within 10 days, the investigation settled on Ian Bailey as its prime suspect. Scratches seen on his face and arms in the days after the murder made him a person of interest. I do remember that two guards came out to the prairie and I met them outside and I had my sleeves rolled up and they noticed that I had these light markings on my arms. And they could have taken a photograph, and they should have taken a photograph of them there and then. Bailey said there was an innocent explanation for the scratches. The day before the murder, he had killed three turkeys for Christmas. How does one get scratched in the face by a turkey when well, you're killing Well, first of all, I wasn't... A, I, in, in the process of dis, I, what I do with when I did do the turkeys in, as it were, uh, I put their feet into a little loop and hung them from a, a hook in the shed. And in doing so, as I was trying to get the feet into the hook, one of the, the, the feet uh, just sort of ground, glanced across the top of my head, but it, that was not on my face. It was in my hairline, and it wasn't a particularly... Um, it was a, a light scratch. And then the next job we had to do on the Sunday was we decided because of the price of Christmas trees, we would actually take the top off a Sitka spruce. I would climb up the tree, use the saw, take off the top of the tree and then drag it down. And that was then going to become our, our Christmas tree. And he got some scratches on his arm from cutting the tree. And you know when you get a comb and you just drag it across your skin, it was the finest like little needly scratches very very parallel and very fine you know as if you drew a comb across your arm these then become exaggerated into something approaching briar or bramble scratches which they were not it wasn't long before ian bailey's name was being publicly associated with murder I started to hear from other members of the media that I was somehow involved in the crime. And I did say to one journalist, who's saying this, who's saying this? And she wouldn't tell me. And I did subsequently, regrettably, make light of the issue by saying, oh, yes, of course I did it, which was a, a, a purely ironic uh, response to the um, allegation. Seven weeks after the murder, an article appeared in the Sunday World. It said the arrest of the prime suspect was imminent. A man, a non-national, had been seen with scratches to his face. The next day, Ian Bailey got a knock on his door. I was arrested. I was taken to the barrack. I, immediately, the hostility in the vehicle began. There was one, at least one cameraman already there. I was photographed being taken into the station. And I was in a state of absolute shock being told, you did it, you did it. The interrogation focused on Bailey's movements. He said that on the night of the murder, he had gone to the galley pub with Jules. 
there was a traditional session happening in the in the galley bar. I had my baron with me. I used to play the baron, and there was a, there was a, it was a very nice atmosphere. You know, pre-Christmas. There are a group of visiting musicians, uh, I think from Armagh, playing traditional music. And I said, would they have any objection if I joined in? They said no. We stayed there till quite late. It was a lock-in, so it was around midnight, half twelve, before we thought of coming back. Ian went and got the car, and we drove on home. He said at some stage he had a funny feeling that something was going on. It was very strange, something's going on somewhere. Bailey then changed his account of the night of the murder to Gardy. At first he'd said he'd slept all night. Then he said he got up in the middle of the night to write. I had a story deadline for the Monday morning. I part written the story and I'd researched it, but I hadn't finished it. At some point during the night, I left the bed, came down to the kitchen table, and I hand wrote the story. So, and then I went back to bed. I said I couldn't remember if he did get up. Inconsistency. I may have said he didn't get up first, because I don't remember him getting up. It's very difficult to remember every tiny little thing. And it was an oversight on my part, and I subsequently corrected that. Now, now, the fact that I actually was honest about the fact that I got up to write has got me into an awful lot of hot water, as it were. And I mean, that was information that I didn't really have to impart. Your recall of the scratches, and particularly the scratch from uh, the turkey, why do you think that if he had got it before the murder, you didn't notice it before because the murder? Because his hair covered it. But then you did notice it yeah. The day after the murder. Yeah, well, maybe he brushed his hair back and I saw it. It was, it was like the teeniest little nick, like a twig or a turkey claw just flicking you, you know? It wasn't... They do flap around an awful lot when you kill them. It's horrible. If, though, you got the scratches when you say you did mm -hmm. before she was murdered, mm -hmm. why then did nobody in the galley pub that n night notice those scratches? Well, because I, 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 I had a long sleeve shirt. I knew Ian had nothing to do with it. I've got three gorgeous daughters. I would never subject them to a murderer in the same house. I would be the first person to hand him in, actually, if I had even an inkling that he'd done it. There's no way he committed that murder. During his interrogation, he learned a witness had placed him not far from Sophie's house at a time when he'd said he was at home. The statement of a local shopkeeper, Marie Farrell, located Bailey a mile and a half from the scene at 3 a.m. This claim was central to the Garda case. On my first arrest, I was being told without any names that somebody had seen me on the road at Kilfodder Bridge in the early hours of the morning of the 23rd. I became aware, largely by members of the media informing me, that a lady called Maria Farrell, who'd recently moved to Skull, was making allegations against me. Uh, at the station, I was detained, I was interrogated, questioned, accused, and released. The day after his arrest, at least one newspaper took the unusual step of identifying Bailey. The media camped out on his doorstep. He was faced with a choice. From the moment I was released, I had a, almost like the world's press knocking on the door. Did you know Sophie Toscan de Plante? So what did you say? Did you tell the police on your emploi du temps at that moment? I chose, because I'm a journalist and I know how journalists work, to talk to them. What do you mean by accusé, c'est-à-dire? I was, um, it was made absolutely certain to me by all my interrogating officers that I was the murderer. They had no doubt, they knew it was me. They just needed me to confess. My identity was out there. I didn't give my identity out. I note this morning in the Examiner that the Garda Shirkana are saying that they didn't release my name. But who did? I was presented with a situation where the world had been told, in effect, this is the man. If they had evidence, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I, I wouldn't have been released. Yeah, yeah. Well... I know I'm, I'm innocent. I have nothing to do with this killing. Did you kill him? No. 
Although Bailey had been released without charge, Gardy wrote to the DPP arguing that Bailey needed to be arrested and charged, as there is every possibility that he will kill again. Before long, Bailey was cemented in the public imagination as the only real suspect in the case. The community seems to have been hugely divided. It was. It caused a complete schism. And were you conscious of it? I was conscious of some of the things. I wasn't conscious of the fact that, for instance, after I left a bar, there was a statement given that the, the, the bar lady said, oh, that's the man who murdered the French woman, and everybody applauded after I got... I wasn't aware of that until I saw that statement many years later. Well, there were a lot of people in the area who were making it very difficult. There was a lot of nasty business going on around the front gate. Someone painted red all over the entrance of our post box, like splattered it, like looked to look like blood. Did you ever think about leaving Ireland as a consequence? No, I, I didn't. And I, it became very hard for me to, to function in my professional capacity. And uh, a large number of people were told, our neighbours were told, have no doubt it's that so-and-so Bailey. The media had its suspect. However, the Gardaí didn't have the evidence. EPP told Gardaí that a second arrest of Jules would be unlawful. Despite this warning, in September 2000, Jules was arrested again. No evidence would be presented to a judge, however, until 2003, when Bailey sued seven newspapers for libel. Ian Bailey could not have been prepared for what was about to unfold. Today, his libel action against seven Irish and British newspapers arising out of their coverage of the case opened at the circuit court in Cork. His barrister... If you're told by a, a Garda source and all journalists sort of are, are only as good as their contacts and sources, have no doubt, categorically, it's him. You, I can understand why they chose to take the hook the newspapers acknowledged they identified Ian Bailey as a suspect, but they denied they said he was the murderer. To defend themselves, the newspapers were given copies of the Garda file on Bailey. Many of the paper's witnesses had previously volunteered statements to Gardaí. Marie Farrell was one of the paper's key witnesses. She testified she had seen Bailey at Kielfada Bridge. She also alleged that Bailey had tried to persuade her to change her statements. Marie Farrell claims she suffered harassment and intimidation from Ian Bailey, including cutthroat gestures and his finger pointed Later to his he temple. He asked her to cash a cheque for around £25, which he got from the Examiner newspaper. This is all her death is worth to me, he said. There's no money in bumping people off. Oh, it was just unbelievable. First of all, it was us taking a case against the papers and it turned very quickly into a murder trial. We didn't have any knowledge of what witnesses they had. It was just horrific. Malachi Reed was 14 years old when he asked Ian Bailey for a lift home from school one evening in February 1997. A number of Skull locals testified that Bailey had admitted to them that he was the murderer. Mr. Reed asked him how work was going. Malachi Reed claims Ian Bailey replied, it was fine until I went up there with a rock and it bashed her brains in. Two other witnesses, Richard and Rosie Shelley, said Ian Bailey came into the kitchen. He was upset. He put his arms around Richard Shelley and said, I did it. I went too far. So many people all coming forward and all saying Ian Bailey one way or another said, surely it's beyond coincidence. Surely there's something there. Well, um, uh, one, I, they weren't admissions. I was using irony as a tactic, albeit I can see now very unwisely. Today, Judge Patrick Moran ruled against Ian Bailey on all three points. Bailey was awarded just 8,000 euro in damages and had to pay over 200,000 euro to the newspapers in costs. The decision was later overturned in the High Court when Bailey accepted an offer of a settlement. They agreed to cover the cost of the libel case and gave Bailey a payment of 70,000 euro. It was the evidence though at the libel trial of assaults by Bailey on his partner that shocked and appalled. 
Ian Bailey has acknowledged what have been described as three vicious assaults on his partner Jules Thomas between 19. Bailey continued to beat Ms. Thomas. She received a black eye, a swollen cheekbone and chin, and cuts to her lips as well as bruising to her arms and legs. She still fears for her safety. I know he was very sorry he did it, that it was something that happened very quickly and was over in a flash and it should never have happened. He, he's actually so remorseful about what he did to me. But he did it again and then again. Yes, I know we kept drinking. It was a problem. Violence, you can't really contest that, can you? Uh, no, but it has to be taken in context. Uh, is there a context for domestic violence? Well, there, there was in my case because I'd, I, I, I was irresponsible with alcohol. I was irresponsible with whiskey. The third time he was, he'd broken his Achilles tendon, snapped it, and he was on serious painkillers and he drank on top of those, so I don't think he really knew what he was doing hardly the third time. Isn't that a bit pat, though, just blaming spirits? and not a question of character? Well, I mean, I, all. I, all I know is what, that I, I, I was irresponsible in the extreme and I've accepted responsibility. Well, he hasn't touched me in 12 years or whatever it is. You know, he's, he's never, after the last time, he's never made any violent gesture towards me. So I don't believe it's in his nature. I think we were just totally stressed out, drank too much and argued. The libel trial went into very, very personal details from your diaries. You wrote in some detail about being sexually very aggressive. You said that you were a monster or a beast or something like um, that. I, I, do you know? I, I can't remember. I may, I may have made a reference to my behavior towards Jules, that I behaved very badly. Um, but the, that doesn't make me a killer. And have you forgiven him the abuse? Of course I've forgiven him. Why, of course? I think forgiveness is really necessary if, if you care for someone like that and you know that they really are going to keep their word this time. I believe he, he keeps his word now. Do you love this man? I must do. In 2005, the Garda case against Bailey suffered a serious setback. Marie Farrell was the key witness in one of the country's most famous murder investigations. Why has she now changed her story? Marie Farrell, who had claimed she saw Ian Bailey at Kielfotter Bridge on the night of the murder, made a dramatic television appearance. You made a statement saying that the man was Ian Bailey. That's right. Was this man Ian Bailey? No. I told them I was withdrawing the statements, that it was all more or less bullshit that was in the statements, and I wanted to withdraw them. And they told did that, me... Did you use those words? Yes. That it was bullshit? Yes. I had a phone call from uh, Mr. Frank Budimer, who took over my case, telling me that Maria Farrell had contacted him and wanted to tell him the truth. And he subsequently met with her, and she told him her story that she had been pressurized to make false statements to implicate me in this crime and that she just couldn't deal with it, handle it anymore. She was basically cracking up. I am telling the truth now. Why would I put myself in the spotlight like this if I wasn't telling the truth? And you must remember, it was on foot of the Marie Farrell statement, so-called, that Ian Bailey was arrested. That was the catalyst to cause his arrest. Nothing else. After a failed attempt to extradite Ian Bailey for questioning in 2010, the French authorities are now seeking to extradite him for trial. He has been charged with voluntary homicide. I have questions 20 years after my mother's death. Nobody give answers to my questions. Nobody. There are too many strange things about Mr. Bailey. He battled, he hurts Jules Thomas. 
not one time, but two times, but more. He has no real alibi. First, he said that he didn't know my mother, now I don't know, but people said that he knows. There is hundreds of evidence which are facing one way. And there is no, even one evidence going in the opposite way. No one, no one. So I have my questions and, and, and until there is a trial, I will keep asking my questions. The French indictment of Ian Bailey is a 44-page document detailing the evidence and witnesses who gave statements against him. However, the indictment relies on Marie Farrell's original statements to Gardy. The French indictment says of Marie Farrell that, quote, the spontaneity of her retractions are doubtful. No, not at all. And that's a... Uh, that's a a, a, a a great falsity no absolutely not at all i do know that statements once given even if subsequently withdrawn rebutted or refuted in french law can actually still be used in evidence sure as some of the lesions that were observed on the victim's body in its environment the reasons he presented could not explain them no i mean that's a, t a total nonsense and fiction i mean that's just a french interpretation to somehow support the false narrative. The French indictment also says, neither the cutting of the tree nor the killing of the turkeys could have caused the wounds that were observed by the witnesses after the 23rd of December. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. All witnesses agreed that on the contrary, Ian Bailey did not have any marks on his arms, hands and face. Well, uh, that is factually flawed. The French investigation team had a psychiatrist read uh, these extracts from the diary and offer an opinion on your character. Um, he mentions, I'm quoting directly now, narcissism, psycho-rigidity, violence, impulsiveness, egocentricity, intolerance of frustration and a great need for recognition. Do you recognize yourself in any of that? No, no, no I don't. There were a number of mistakes, maybe, that I made a mountain You have no alibi. Well, I, um, do I need an alibi? Uh, I, I mean, I know that I have nothing to do with this. Now, it's very difficult to prove a negative, and all, this has been one of my problems over the years. Because I was so, I, I've been accused, all of the effort was put on to making me the murderer. I, it's very difficult to, to prove a negative. And I, I, I've not been able to sufficiently so far um, do that. And do you believe all of that points to Ian Bailey being guilty or Ian Bailey having questions to answer? Mr. Bailey is um, a strange person. It's not evidence, is it? Um, it's a, it's a suspicion, just because... It's a, it's a suspicion. Would it worry you if an innocent man went to jail? Of course. Really. And you do not think that that is going to happen in this case? I don't know. I'm not saying he's the one, but I am not a judge. I am a son, and my mother has been killed. My job is not deciding people is guilty or not. You have a legal system, we have a legal system, and I let them decide. The lion's share of the evidence assembled in the French indictment was already considered by the DPP in Ireland. Ian Bailey, who's now in his final year of a law degree at UCC, was arrested and questioned twice by the Gardaí in 1997 and 1998. Ten years later, the DPP decided that no charges be preferred against anyone here in connection with the murder. The French have now issued a European arrest warrant for Ian Bailey. Mr. Bailey is challenging a High Court decision to extradite him to France. His lawyers argued that documents provided to them in unusual circumstances late last year should be admitted as evidence. Six years ago, when Bailey was first fighting his extradition, the DPP took the unprecedented step of giving Ian Bailey's solicitor 
a dossier detailing why it had decided against prosecuting him. Mr. Barnes said the Garda investigation was thoroughly flawed and prejudiced in relation to Mr. Bailey. That document in 2001 demolished the police case against Ian Bailey. At that time, Marie Farrell was still a key witness on behalf of the police. But interestingly, the director's dossier or critical analysis document recognized her total unreliability. All the evidence, as far as I can see, that's used in the French indictment is considered by the DPP as far back as 2001 and, and completely rejected. And yet it still has now managed to find its way in, into the, the, the French uh, arrest warrant and indictment. Ian Bailey and his partner Jules Thomas arriving at court this morning with Mr. Bailey's solicitor for the start of his action against the state. His lawyers told the court he will allege that Garthy conspired to manufacture evidence against him by unlawful means. These included... Ian Bailey tried to sue the state and the Garthy in 2014. During the case, the court ruled that the jury shouldn't see the DPP's dossier or hear Eamon Barnes' opinion of the Garda investigation. Bailey lost. I didn't win, but I certainly didn't feel defeated when I came away, and it brought out an awful lot of information, which we'd been aware of for a long time. Bailey alleged in the case he lost that he was the victim of a Garda conspiracy. The jury were played recordings of phone calls between Garda investigating Bailey but nearly all of Bailey's claims were deemed too old to be admissible. Two years later, High Court Judge Niall Fennelly examined the same tapes of Garda phone calls. He concluded some of the Gardies showed the intent to modify evidence against Bailey. The calls show some Gardi in Bandon were prepared to contemplate altering, modifying or suppressing evidence that did not support their belief that Ian Bailey had murdered Sophie Toscan de Plantier even though there was no evidence they had actually done so. The High Court's decision today to deny Bailey's extradition means that he may still face a murder trial in Paris. There is an element of fear that at the back of my mind, and Jules's mind particularly, that I might be, you know, taken away again. And I mean, we, despite whatever uh, differences we had and whatever domestic problems we had, we we're, were very close. and. You know, I love her dearly, and I, I think she loves me dearly. And we, um, like all people, you know, we don't get on necessarily um, all, very well all the time, but we, we're very close, and it's a constant fear that um, for her that I might be taken away and put in the Bastille or something. If the French are unsuccessful in extraditing him, he will be tried in absentia. The French will say that they are seeking Mr. Bailey's removal, but in anticipation of the fact that he won't be removed, my understanding is that they intend to go ahead with this trial in his absence. I don't think that that is a good system of justice, but nonetheless, the French do. My strong feelings is if France is going to decide that Mr. Bailey is guilty, Ireland will change her mind. So you will not rest if he is found guilty until he is sent no. to France? You would keep campaigning? Yeah. It is in my mind an intention to write a subsequent letter to the DPP, and I'm going to suggest that the DPP or the authorities in Ireland invite French prosecutors to travel here to Ireland and to oversee under Irish law my trial here. You would be happy to surrender yourself to the Irish authorities to stand trial in this country? For I this would party. welcome it. I mean, it seems like a very strange thing to, for an individual to be saying, I would welcome it. Try me for murder? Absolutely. I am confident that we'll get the answer. I don't know if it will be tomorrow, in one month, in one year, in 10 years, but I must get the answer for my grandparents before they die. This will be with me for the rest of my life and will only really end when I, when I, when I pass. 
I would hope that when that moment comes, I will have cleared my name. I've been protesting my innocence from the moment of my first arrest, 20 years ago plus now, and I'm still, unfortunately, in a position where I'm having to do that. judgment is very clear with all the element of proof Jan Bailey is a murderer and he killed my mother 22 years ago so it's a victory for the justice it's a victory for the truth and now Ireland will have to extradit Jan Bailey and we will put all the pressure on everywhere to get the justice done. The justice had been set and now the justice had to be done in France, in Ireland, wherever. But today everybody must know understand that Jan Bailey is a murderer and we must denounce it. How do you feel today? I feel not good. I feel I have a big emotion for my mother and the truth is very important for us for her, for all the people who lived around this monster, monster. so we are, we are happy, we are happy, thank you very much. Ian Bailey and his solicitor Frank Buttam are leaving the criminal courts today after the High Court ruled that he cannot be extradited to France to face a retrial in connection with the murder of Sophie Toscan du Plantier in West Cork 24 years ago. The 63-year-old who lives outside Skull in West Cork did not want to say anything today and his solicitor spoke on his behalf. Mr Bailey is extremely relieved uh, at the decision which has been made today. The impact on his life of the entire situation has been extremely challenging for him for the past 24 years. He always expresses his uh, sadness and his sympathy for the family of the late Madame Toscan du Plantier whilst at the same time always maintaining his innocence. Last year, a court in Paris convicted Ian Bailey in his absence of the murder of the French film producer and sentenced him to 25 years in prison. A third extradition warrant for his surrender was issued by the French authorities and Mr Bailey's lawyers argued against it, stating that Bailey had a vested or ironclad right as a result of the Supreme Court decision in 2012, rejecting the first attempt by the French for his extradition. Some of the reasoning behind this 2012 decision was that the alleged murder took place outside the issuing state, which was France, and because Ian Bailey was not an Irish citizen. The High Court in 2017 dismissed the second request by the French authorities, describing it as an abusive process. Today, Mr Justice Paul Burns said that because of the previous rulings in Ian Bailey's favour, he could not order his extradition. He also dismissed the state's submissions that a change in the law last year in relation to extraterritorial jurisdiction could be applied in this case. The investigation into the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier is based in Bandon Garda Station in Cork and the serious crime review team, which has now been called in to assist the investigation, is expected to begin work next month. 
The self-professed main suspect, Ian Bailey, and the victim's family have welcomed the announcement of a full review of the case and all evidence gathered since the 39-year-old French filmmaker was found murdered in December 1996. Sophie Toscan de Plantier's son today described the review as very good news for justice and said the family was anticipating positive developments. As you know, my family and I, we are deeply involved in the fight for the justice of my mother. So we, are, um, we were expecting for that, and I think it's a very good news for, for the justice. We have big expectations with uh, this new inv investigation with the service review team. Uh, I think this uh, new investigation is uh, in a way that, uh, that the Guardia recognize that th there have been some mistakes uh, during the original investigation. Sophie Toscan de Plantier's family also believe there are new elements in the case and they expect the review to be sufficiently resourced. The Garda Commissioner, who was at the Policing Authority meeting today, said there was a lot of information out there. Something may have been triggered in someone's mind, and he appealed for anyone with information to come forward. He also said this review was necessary and would be fully resourced. It's not a futile uh, exercise. If, if we felt that there was, there was to be no hope in this, we wouldn't undertake it. We've already been through a process to decide that this is work worth doing, and it's worth, uh, in, in effect, applying resources to this to bring, in, in effect, uh, an outcome which identifies uh, a suspected per perpetrator and, and report them to the Director of Public Prosecutions. This is an investigation and we approach it in that way and we approach it with an open and investigative and inquiring mind. No time limit has been placed on the work of the Serious Crime Review Team.